In Tucson, where clouds are a rare sight in the sky for most of the year, the daily motions of the astronomical sky are easy to appreciate. In this lesson, we will look at how the sky above us changes on a daily and hourly basis. With things moving around so much, sometimes it can be hard to find a particular object on the night sky, so we will discuss ways to orient ourselves in the sky, for example, by looking for familiar shapes, and by looking at and interpreting maps of the location of the stars. Some of these daily motions and changes are very obvious. Here is a video of the Catalina Mountains taken from the U of A campus, spanning the period from just before sunrise to just after sunset. The sun rises in the east and drifts across the sky, casting shadows first to the west and then to the east as it sets in the west at the end of the day. The sky brightens when the sun comes up and darkens when it sets, at which point stars appear in the night sky. Where do the stars go during the day? They are still there in the sky, we just can't see them because the sky is too bright. What makes the sky so bright? That light comes from the sun, of course. The sky is bright when the sun is up and turns dark when it sets. But the light doesn't come from the sun directly. Imagine the sun emitting light in all directions and an observer a certain distance away. The only light from the sun that reaches this observer is that which travels in a straight line from the sun. And an image of the sky would look like this image here, where there is a bright source of light in the center surrounded by darkness. Now instead, consider what happens when light from the sun encounters the Earth's atmosphere. Some photons travel uninterruptedly, such that we still see the sun very clearly through the atmosphere. Some of the photons encounter molecules in the atmosphere and are scattered. In other words, they are absorbed and re-emitted in a different direction, so that their original paths are changed. Some of those scattered photons will be deflected back towards the observer, which makes it look as if there is sunlight coming from all directions and not just the actual location of the sun. In this case, the observer's view looks more like a central, stronger source of light representing the photons that reach us directly, immersed in a background of deflected sunlight. Of course, what we actually see in the sky looks more like this. You will understand why when we talk about the physics of light and color later in the course. The amount of scattering depends on the density of the molecules. When we ascend above the Earth's atmosphere, for example, if you were to take a ride on the space shuttle, the sun would just look just as bright, but the rest of the sky would get darker and darker until it becomes as black as night and the stars come out during the day. The picture on top of the screen is taken from the International Space Station, orbiting 200 miles above the Earth's surface. It shows the sun setting behind the Earth's atmosphere. The dark circle below the atmosphere is the Earth in shadow. The black part above the atmosphere is space, where molecular density is too low for any light to scatter. I particularly like this photo because it shows how much the atmospheric density varies with height above the Earth's surface. As the density goes down, the amount of scattering is decreased and the brightness decreases in step. It also shows just how dispersive the atmosphere is all that blue light comes from the tiny source of light in the center, the sun. Lastly, it makes it very clear just how thin the atmosphere is. It's hard to define an edge for the atmosphere since the density goes down slowly, but a reasonable number for the height, within which you'll find 99.9% .9 of molecules, is about 60 miles. Compare that to the 8,000 miles that comprise the Earth's diameter. But for now, Let's ignore the effects of the atmosphere. In fact, let's ignore the sun, moon, and all the planets altogether and concentrate on the distant universe. Imagine yourself suspended in space, since we got rid of the Earth as well. You are surrounded by stars in all directions. On human time scales, these stars move very, very, very slowly. We could wait here for thousands of years 
and the stars would mostly look the same, frozen in place. Maps of the stars, made 2,000 years ago, look the same as today, and the same apparent groupings of stars were popular with ancient civilizations, although perhaps under a different guise. The Big Dipper was known to the ancient Greeks as Ursa Major, the great bear wandering the sky. But to the Mayans, it was a parrot, and to us, well, a spoon. In modern maps, the whole sky is divided into parcels, just like our country is divided into states. Each of these regions of sky is called a constellation, whereas the patterns of bright stars like the Big Dipper or Orion are called asterisms. The other important thing to remember with asterisms is that these familiar patterns, Orion's belt, the Big Dipper, etc., are celestial projections, and there is often no physical association between these stars. Sometimes the true three-dimensional distances between stars can be very great, but it's only in two dimensions that they appear close to each other. But back to you. Floating out there in space, you look lonely. Let's bring the Earth back under your feet. On the surface of the Earth, at any time you can only see half of the universe. The other half is hidden below your feet, or more precisely below your horizon. What half of the Earth you see depends on where you are on the surface of the spherical Earth. We will continue to ignore the Sun, Moon, and planets. But now, let's start moving the static universe. Let's spin our Earth up so that it rotates about its axis once every 24 hours. For an observer rotating with the Earth, the Earth doesn't seem to move, but rather the stars appear to move in the opposite direction. This is an example of relative motion. Just like a person on a train sees the landscape whooshing by. So what direction do we move in? Stars and the sun and the moon and planets rise in the east and set in the west because the earth spins from west to east. A good mnemonic that'll make it easier for you to remember is to curl the fingers of your right hand and stick your thumb up. The direction that the fingers are curling is the direction of the Earth's rotation. Your thumb points along the direction of the North Pole. This video, taken from a mountaintop in Chile, where some of the world's largest telescopes reside, shows this motion of the sky, but time has been sped up. At these speeds, and with a little imagination, it is easier to think of ourselves as passengers on spaceship Earth, spinning against the background of fixed stars. In general, though, our senses make it hard to accept that the Earth is moving at all, and we are moving very fast. At the latitude of Tucson, we're moving at 880 miles per hour. But we just don't sense any apparent motion. In fact, as you will see in a later lesson, it wasn't until recently that the notion of a rotating Earth became commonly accepted. It's much easier for us to instead imagine the entire sky rotating around us, since that is what we observe with our senses. We see the sun rising and setting, and stars moving across the sky. Because the Earth is a sphere, we represent the sky as a celestial sphere surrounding the Earth upon which all celestial objects are projected, regardless of how far away they are from the Earth. In this case, the two stars at a very different distance appear nearby projected onto the celestial sphere. Their projected distance is much smaller than their true distance. Also projected upon the celestial sphere, this time from the inside, are the Earth's poles and the Earth's equator which become known as the North and South Celestial Pole and the Celestial Equator. The celestial sphere rotates about the axis that connects the poles, which means that every point in the sky moves, well, appears to move, except for the North and South Celestial Poles. At the location of the North Celestial Pole, very nearby at least, 
you will find Polaris, the North Star. There is nothing special about the star. It is not the brightest in the sky, and it won't even be the North Star forever, but more on that in the next lesson. But it is where the pole is located now, and will be for many centuries, which means that the entire sky appears to rotate around Polaris, and it is the only point in the sky, along with the South Pole, that always stays in the same location. It is also very helpful because once you locate it, you know which way north is, which, along with giving you bearings on the night sky, can help you find your way home if you get lost in the woods at night. Since Polaris is not a very bright star, it can be difficult to find it first in the night sky, although you'll soon become very adept. An easy way to find it is through the Big Dipper. You can use the two end stars of the Dipper as pointer stars to find Polaris. Another helpful thing to know is how far up from the horizon you might expect to see it. Remember, while other stars move across the sky throughout the night, Polaris is always in the same position. This is a picture of the night sky. It is a special kind of picture very popular with amateur astrophotographers where the shutter was left open for many hours and therefore the motion of the stars in the sky was recorded as these arcs, which we call star trails. You'll see that all stars seem to rotate around Polaris, which has itself a tiny arc because it isn't exactly at the pole. It's obvious from this picture that some stars near Polaris never rise or set, but just travel in circles above the horizon. These stars are called circumpolar, and the fraction of the sky that is circumpolar is naturally going to depend on how high up the pole is from the horizon. You will find out during lab how to calculate the height of Polaris on the sky, but in order to do this, we need to talk coordinates first. There are many different ways of specifying the location of a celestial object. The one we will mostly use throughout this course is the altitude azimuth system, which relates the position of a star to an observer's local horizon. The altitude of a star is how many degrees above the horizon it is, anywhere from 0 to 90 degrees. The azimuth of a star is how many degrees along the horizon it is and corresponds to the compass direction. Azimuth starts from exactly north, which is 0 degrees azimuth, and increases clockwise. Exactly east equals 90 degrees, exactly south equals 180 degrees, exactly west 270 degrees, and exactly north, again, 0 degrees or 360. For example, a star in the southwest could have an azimuth between 180 and 270 degrees. Since stars change their position with respect to your horizon throughout the night, their altitude azimuth position changes. Also, observers at different locations looking at the same star will see it at a different altitude azimuth position. So along with the alt-as angles, you need to specify your location and the time in order to uniquely specify the star's position in the sky.